right, hello there, thrill seekers. That was a little piece of my rendition of the song Marky Moon by television uh, in honor of the late Tom Verlaine, who we lost, uh, the, one of the guitarists of television, along with Richard Lloyd and one of my guitar heroes. Uh, also, if you read my book, uh, Letters to a Dead Friend about Zen, you'll know uh, the, the specialness of uh, the name Marky Moon. And if you haven't read the book, you'll have to read the book, and then you'll find out why I might have covered the song Marky Moon today for reasons other than the passing of Tom Verlaine. So there you go. Reason to read the book. So I'd like to talk to you about an email I just got. And I'm not going to read the whole email, but I'll read you part of it. And it's a subject I've talked about too much on this video channel, but I'm going to talk about it again. And apologies to people who are getting sick of me talking about this. Here it goes. While it may not be the most important part of your teaching, I appreciate your commitment to not drinking the kook aid of places like SFZC, that's San Francisco Zen Center, Upaya, etc. I recall SFZC begging us to write letters during the 2020 election to people we didn't even know in swing states trying to influence elections in the name of Buddhism. I remember sitting in the Upaya practice period last year hearing Wendy Johnson, that's a teacher at San Francisco Zen Center, and Dan Layton, that's a guy, I, uh, I think he's one of the great uh, scholars of Dogen who's written some good translations or co-translations of Dogen's work. Uh, they were calling Republicans the party of racist insurrectionists, among other horrible things, for nearly an hour while disparaging anti, let's say, jabbers. She doesn't use the word jabbers, jab in the, in the arm, we'll call it. You know what I mean. They were intentionally ginning up hatred and disdain, and students continued to parrot this speech during discussions for several days until I decided to end my attendance uh, to the programs. This turns my stomach and seems the opposite of everything that I've read about Zen or come to understand on my own. Zen in America is not only accepting but praising harsh judgments, declaration of what views are right and wrong, using disparaging speech against others, engaging in or encouraging practices of ex exclusion around jabs, medical uh, treatments of certain kinds that if you talk about them on YouTube, you get problems, so I'm not using certain words, and encouraging and amplifying and holding fast to opinions. And uh, there's more to the email, but that's all I'm going to read you. The, this whole thing, and I really don't like talking about it that much. Uh, maybe it seems like I do because I talk about it, but it's it's a big problem. And I, I think it's a big problem for Buddhism in America, particularly in Zen, but I think it, it's, it's going around to Buddhism as a whole in America or Eastern religions in general in, in the United States. And it's going to be the undoing of Eastern religions in the United States, I think because it's, it's sort of supplanting what's really important. It's supplanting compassion with fake compassion, is I think what it's doing. Uh, there's a difference between this sort of wokeism and compassion. And I think the, the key difference is that woke sort of fake compassion, phony compassion, is motivated by aggression. Uh, the, the compassionate aspects of what the woke folks are into are just excuses for aggression. So anything anything that's sort of promoted, uh, I don't know, uh, being against racism and homophobia and uh, uh, climate change and saving the whales and whatever the hell else, you know, it doesn't doesn't even really matter. All of these things are trotted out mainly as excuses for aggressive behavior. So that's it. it so you could you could just as easily use the excuse of being for racism, you know, and use that as your excuse for aggressive behavior because the re the end result is just aggressive behavior. Uh, Nishijima Roshi used to talk about this a lot, and you know, he was. He, 
dead before the whole woke thing took off, so he wasn't really talking about this, but he would talk about a balance of the autonomic nervous system. And one of the things he used to warn about is when, let's see, I think I'm going to get this right, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems he would talk about. Uh, and I hope I'm getting this right. When the parasympathetic nervous system is too strong, you're prone to be uh, very sort of passive and sort of sweet and everything is hunky-dory and this is what sort of spiritual people are generally tend to kind of get into you know they sort of are like oh everything is one and we're one with the world and that's sort of the thing it, it, historically you you we tended to kind of warn the religious type person who's into Eastern religions against falling into that trap. Well, what seems to be happening more lately is falling into the other trap, which is getting too far into the sympathetic, where the sympathetic nervous system is too strong, and what Nishijima Roshi used to characterize that as, and I think if you look this up uh, in anywhere, they talk about what the sympathetic nervous system is all about, I think he was right, is that you become too sharp, too aggressive, and you, you just kind of point outwards at everything and see the problems as being over there, and you want to go, you know, and go and, and make something happen and go fix it. And and that's, I think, what happens is 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 you're ginning up the, the sympathetic nervous system too much, and you're, you're, you're just, you're doing all this stuff to just get into that zone, and you're becoming unbalanced in that direction. And, and this whole stuff, that what she's writing about, what my, the person who wrote this to me is writing about, just seems so bizarre to me. Like, like writing letters to people to try to influence elections in the name of Buddhism. What is that about? I mean, if, if I received that kind of letter, I mean, even me as a person who's pretty steeped in Buddhism, I'm going to think that's pretty weird. Anybody who's, I don't know where they're getting these mailing lists from, but if it's somebody who's just been to a Zen center once or twice and they get this letter asking them to vote, you know, some for some party in the name of, of Buddhism, that sounds like cult stuff. And the the best you're going to get as a result of that is is the person's going to ignore the letter and at worst they're going to out of spite vote the opposite direction because they're like these culties are weird i don't want to get these weird letters from culties anymore and, and and it's really disturbing to me to see somebody like dan layton involved in this who can't you know you'd think somebody who's supposed to be one of the leaders one of the the great people i've got books by dan layton up here on my shelf somebody who's like a long-term practitioner should know better than this you know so even the the leaders of of buddhism in america don't know better than this this is why i don't have high hopes for where buddhism is going in america because it seems to be so steeped in this kind of wokeism which is as i say all about aggression and using so-called compassion as an excuse for aggression i i tried to talk about this in in one of my books and i'm not trying to use this as a an excuse to advertise my books but here it is an ad for my books but this is something uh, dogan talked about and and the title of the book is don't be a jerk which comes from my uh, weird interpretation of dogan's essay shoaku makusa which is uh, usually translated as uh, not doing wrong and i i just gave it the flashy title of don't be a jerk because i thought that was a kind of a, a funny way of, of saying not doing wrong but one of my favorite lines in the essay shoaku makusa i translated or i paraphrased as even if the whole universe is nothing but a bunch of jerks doing all kinds of jerk type things there is still liberation in simply not being a jerk now when people saw that uh, a lot of people said well what did dogen really say and what i said just to be a, a kind of a jerk myself in the book is what he really said is shoaku tatohi ikukasu nari no sankai ni 
Binishi Ikuka, I'm sorry, Ikukasa Nari no Sambo o Tenkyu Kuseri Tomo Kore Sai Saku no Geratsu Nari. <laughs> That's what he really said. You know, when people say what did he really said, they, they want a, a, a more a normal translation. But the thing is, he wasn't speaking English. That's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, let's see, the Nishijima and cross translation goes. Even if wrong upon wrong pervade the whole universe, and even if wrongs have swallowed the whole dharma again and again, there is still salvation and liberation in not committing. And, and it ends with not committing because that's kind of the way it ends in Japanese. And as I often say, the Nishijima and Cross versions are, the translations they did, are really as close as you're probably ever going to get to a really direct translation. I always say it's kind of like if somebody gave you a pair of magic glasses that allowed you to read uh, medieval Japanese without actually being able to read medieval Japanese. Uh, here is Kano, Kazuaki Tanahashi's translation. It goes, even if unwholesome action fills worlds upon worlds and swallows up all things, refrain from is emancipation. So refrain from, so not doing uh, is another way to say. And the Soto Zen text project, which unfortunately is now taken offline, but it used to be online and you could find it for free, uh, their version went, even if evils completely filled however many worlds or completely swallowed however many dharmas, there is still liberation in not doing. So the, the point is, when he talks about don't be a jerk or not doing wrongs, it doesn't mean not doing wrong in the sense of like looking around the world and trying to see what is wrong and fixing in your mind that, I don't know, racism is wrong and homophobia is wrong and being anti-trans is wrong or whatever the flavor of the month thing is wrong, and whatever Twitter is telling you is wrong and whatever Facebook is telling you is wrong. Uh, and and then and then fixing in your mind all those things and not doing wrong it means not doing wrong in this moment in this moment in this real interaction you're having right now with this person in front of you or 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 whatever it is this thing and th the problem with the difference between sort of fake compassion and real compassion one of the big problems is that real compassion isn't as likely to get you hits. You know, it isn't, it isn't going to give you dopamine hits. It isn't going to get you likes on social media. It isn't going to get you pats on the back from your friends because it tends to be a very quiet thing. And to give you an idea of just how quiet real compassion can be, I want to read you from an essay called Canon. Avalokiteshvara, that's the bodhisattva of compassion, and this is uh, one of my favorite essays by Dogen, and I'm going to read you the uh, Nishijima cross version, even though it's a little difficult, but I think this, uh, this one's pretty straightforward in the Nishijima cross version. Great Master Ungan Muju asks Great Master Shuitsu of Dogozan Mountain, what does the bodhisattva of great compassion do by using his limitly abundant hands and eyes. So the great uh, bodhisattva, great compassion, supposedly has limitless hands and eyes. And if you look at a statue of Kanon, the bodhisattva of compassion, they always try to give him infinite hands and eyes. And of course, you can't do that. But uh, they, they try to give him as many hands and eyes uh, as, as possible. Uh, Dogo says, he is like a person in the night reaching back with a hand to grope for a pillow. Ungan says, I understand, I understand. Dogo says, how do you understand? Ungan says, the whole body is hands and eyes. Dogo says, your words are nicely spoken. At the same time, your expression of the truth is just 80 or 90% of realization. Ungan says, I am just like this. How about you, brother? Dogo says, the thoroughly realized body is hands and eyes. And that's a really difficult expression. But the point is, that true compassion is like the hand groping for a pillow in the night. So the image is somebody who's fast asleep and doing this action, which on the surface seems to be almost a selfish action. It's just to try to fix the, the pillow for yourself. 
but it's 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 a completely natural action that expects no reward because it's done in in sleep the 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 person who wakes up with out a stiff neck uh, doesn't even know that this action was was done uh, for for him <laughs> you know it, that's the funny thing because it's it's as if the the person who does the action and the person who benefits from it are in a sense two separate people even though we think of them as the same person continuing from one moment to the next but in in the real sense they're they're like two separate people so that's what real compassion is that doesn't get you likes on social media the the fake compassion of of the kind of woke compassion you know writing letters to the to people to get them to change their vote on the, which won't get them to change their vote anyway or or calling people names for for not getting the proper medical treatment or barring them from coming to your zen center because they don't have the proper injections in their bodies you know which we're coming to find out don't do much of anything to to help protect anybody else anyway so there is no point to telling people they can't come to your zen center if they don't have those injections by the way so i don't know why so many zen centers still have that rule it's ridiculous but anyway it, what was i saying <laughs> Anyway, none of that, none of that, that, that will get you likes, that will get you, you know, pats on the back, that will get everybody saying, oh, you're great, you're great. But real compassion and action is more like the pillow groping in the, in the night, or the hand groping for the pillow in the night, which doesn't get you likes, which doesn't get you hits, which doesn't get you the dopamine fix, and is therefore much less rewarding, much less sexy. And, and it's as I said and I'm gonna say it again because it pisses me off Peop that people like Tig and Dan Layton and these people from San Francisco Zen Center people who are professionals at this people who've been at it longer than I have in the Buddha business that they don't know this is is disturbing and distressing to me that people who are supposed to be leading uh, lights in Buddhism in America can't recognize this for themselves. Uh, it doesn't bode well for for the future of Buddhism. Uh, sometimes I wonder if Buddhism has a future in America. Sometimes I wonder if it's just it's just over. Um, I don't know. I, I think I, I think when I try to be optimistic about it, I think these things roll in waves. And if we look at the history of Buddhism in the past, in, in China and in Japan and places where it's been before, it's gone in similar waves. It's gone up and down and up and down. And I think Buddhism had this rising wave in, in America, you know, through maybe the 60s and 70s. And it's, it, it's peaked and it's, it's receding now. And it, it's it's going to go underground and and there'll be there'll be something that they'll call buddhism and that will exist for a while and it'll be very flashy and it'll be very woke and lots of people will join it and it'll be like a big party and, and everybody will be patting themselves on the back for how wonderful they are doing it and they'll be you know it, it'll get involved in drugs and technologies and stupidity of all sorts uh, but I think the underground of actual Buddhism will quietly putter along at the bottom of it and, uh, and will continue and maybe in 100 or 200 years it'll reemerge at some point. But uh, I think the immediate future of, of Buddhism in America is, is not much, you know, but, but there will be, there'll still be people doing it. There'll still be an underground of people doing it, and and uh, and that's fine, you know, and that's the way it's got to be, and that's the way it's going to go. But the big institutions that supposedly represent Buddhism, uh, right now they don't represent Buddhism at all, and they will probably continue to not represent Buddhism even more <laughs> in the coming years, uh, and and continue to misrepresent Buddhism even more badly. Uh, that's what I expect to happen, uh, and um, 
and that's what we have to look forward to and um yeah um, so uh I guess that sounds maybe that sounds depressing but I'm not as pessimistic as I probably sound um, because I, I have an optimism for the underground movement that will continue uh, that that it'll it'll remain uh, in place and that the roots for that are firmly planted enough that that there's a chance that that will continue, that that's strong enough that it will continue and it won't die. Uh, and and I think that's hopeful. Um, and the big institutions are, are just going to be like they always are, like the Catholic Church is. You know, does the Catholic Church re represent the true Christianity? Of course not. You know, just like the San Francisco Zen Center doesn't represent the true Zen Buddhism and Upaya doesn't represent the true Zen Buddhism and the, the Soto Zen Buddhist Association doesn't represent the truth of, of, of Zen Buddhism. Um, you know, that, that's just the way these big institutions go. They never represent the, the true form of anything. So there you go. That's my opinion. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Anyway, if you want to support the little underground of, uh, of actual Zen, which I hope I represent, I try anyway, you can go to the URL that you're seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. Even if I don't represent the true Buddhism, I've got two dogs. I'm, I'm babysitting or dog sitting my uh, sister-in-law's dog uh, this week. And I got Ziggy to support, so I'll try and get a, a cameo of both of them before uh, the video ends. Uh, so at least I'll buy dog food for them, and uh, and dog food for myself. And uh, we will see you next time. Have a good time, all the time. Later's bye. Okay. Here is my sister-in-law's dog, Fico, so named because his doggy parents are both real estate people and they thought FICO sounded a little bit like Fido and there in his sunbeam oh, there he is here's your old pal Ziggy dog not doing much but sleeping today I'll try to get some action shots for you one of these days but there's Ziggy see you later Ziggy we'll go edit the video <laughs>